Thank you so much. Uh, I am really thrilled to be here and thanks for thinking of me for this. Uh, it was, it's really great to have this kind of informal entry to Vienna in this setting uh, to talk about a topic which is obviously something of deep concern uh, and intense discussion in the United States, but obviously also of concern to uh, those who uh, live elsewhere as well. Um, so basically, as those of you who know American politics uh, the past several years, and certainly since November of 2020, there's grave worries about the state of democracy. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity even today when uh, the election for the governor of Virginia went to somebody who has been challenging critical race theory and picking up on white cultural resentments shows that this uh, is ongoing uh, post Trump. So I wanna talk uh, in these uh, 30 minutes about uh, what I would term a kind of crisis of democracy, um, but I wanna do so in three parts. Basically, I first want to lay out for those of you who are not close followers of American politics, what are, what, what is it that's causing such deep consternation? What are the developments? What is going on? What's happening? Just kind of recap what the situation is. And then second, I want to place the developments of today within with what we historians believe is kind of an added value that we have beyond the day's headlines, which is to provide a deeper historical context to help us to understand how did we get to where we are today. And then finally, third and lastly, I'll conclude by sort of looking toward possibilities toward the future. What might the future hold? Now I'm a historian and historians aren't great at prognosis, but I will, I will uh, conclude with that and then uh, open the floor for comments uh, and discussion. Okay, so just in terms of, uh, where we're at uh, in, uh, today. Um, obviously, November of 2020 and all of the events that followed, culminating on January 6th of 2021, have caused a great deal of alarm. They were preceded by Trump's four years in office eroding the fabric of democracy. But by January 6th, the crisis was full blown. Uh, at that point, Trump had called after months of calling out about stolen votes, found votes, fabricated votes, uh, you know, months of lies about the electoral process. He called his voters to Washington after all its other efforts had failed to overturn the results. Um, and basically uh, in what is, was really a kind of feckless, but real coup attempt, uh, his loyal followers uh, basically engaged in an insurrection at the nation's capital. A very unprecedented event in itself. Um, and what I wanna say about that is that, as we know, American democracy withstood the test at that moment, right? T Trump's efforts were clearly turned back at every stage of the game. He left office peacefully. Joe Biden came in, was inaugurated in what seemed to be a reinvigoration of the United States as a kind of multicultural, multiracial democracy with Kamala Harris at his sign, the first Asian American and African American female vice president, all seem to be positive signs uh, for a kind of return to an alternative tradition of a ro more robust democracy. But if that was the case, we wouldn't be here today and having this discussion about what uh, the future might hold and what is still ongoing. Trump did leave office, but that should not reassure us about the current state of American democracy. Um, since 2021 and even before from last fall until January 6th and beyond, the Republican party itself has shown very serious anti-democratic tendencies throughout the fall into January 6th. Many of those within the Republican party either remained silent or spoke out and backed up Trump's false claims of election fraud. On January 6th itself, 147 Republican party congressmen voted to object to the certification of the election effectively 
calling to overturn the results of a, le a legitimate election with no grounds. That's a scary sign, and that is why there are all these alarms. Since that time, of course, we're in well into 2021, Republicans have used all of those claims to initiate whole sets of restrictive voter laws to undermine the right to vote. So in other words, what happened in the fall not only eroded trust of a large portion of the population of the Republican Party in the legitimacy of uh, the machinery of democracy, but it created the justification for a whole set of laws at the state level to restrict the right to vote. Why? Under the guise, of course, of shoring up the integrity of the ballot, right? So that the language that's used, securing the ballot, shoring up the integrity of the ballot, but really the intention is to tamp down on turnout, tamp down on especially the vote of poor African Americans that are heavily democratic in the cities, which was the focus really of the calls of corruption in last fall, right? The focus was on places like Detroit, Philadelphia, heavily democratic, heavily African American areas. So what kind of laws have been passed at the state level? It depends where you look, but a whole host of states have passed a series of restrictive laws ranging from much tougher voter ID laws, shortening polling hours, making it harder to register, shortening the number of polling places, removing mail-in ballot boxes, making it harder to mail in your ballot, all sorts of means of restricting the vote. Now that comes out of, of course, November because November was the most robust turnout since the early 20th century, right? There was an incredible turnout because states had made it easier to vote. So they're trying to sort of pull in that and also, um, had all sorts of new laws. In Georgia, for example, it's now illegal. You can be charged with a crime if you offer water to somebody who's waiting in line to cast their ballot. Uh, and in the United States, those lines can be very long, especially, again, in urban areas. You don't see those kind of lines in the suburbs. You see them very strong in these urban centers. Um, so other kinds of laws are adding flexibility for Republican-dominated legislatures to effectively have more flexibility in controlling and overturning the votes of those local decision makers in those urban centers. So as my colleagues, Danny Ziblatt and Steve Levitsky argued recently, that may could lead in a close election to Republicans effectively really almost trying to steal the vote, but legally through all of these legal mechanisms that are now being put in place. This is, I mean, this is coming back to Steve Levitsky and Danny Ziblatt again, I think in 2018, they published a very prescient book, How Democracies Die. And in that book, they argued that what is so frightening is precisely the kind of slow erosion that's been happening in the United States and that's been culminating in 2021 is the way that we've seen democracies erode in other parts of the world. In other words, most recent autocratic regimes that have been established, as you probably know, have not been established through revolution. They've not been established through coup d'etats. They've been established while maintaining the norm, the kind of formal procedures of a democracy by holding elections, by adhering to a kind of level of constitutionality and legality. And you can look at that in Turkey, you can look at it in Hungary and Russia and Brazil and many places but still eroding really democracy itself, robust democracy, becoming kind of Ill illiberal democratic regimes. So I won't get into more detail about the, uh, the sort of the, the voting laws. We can talk about that later, but it's just important to note this is all sort of an effort to uh, undermine systematically the right to vote, especially of minority communities and poor communities which, which who tend to run Democratic. And of course, just to tamp down on turnout, because by and large, turnout tends to favor the Democratic Party. Not always, but it tends to. Okay, so what I want to do now is, you know, just to, to note, to finalize that contemporary moment piece, we are at an inflection point, And I think it's a good moment, therefore, to have this kind of discussion. So I want to then turn to 
what got us here, or to talk about sort of how can we explain the Republican Party's growing embrace of these anti-democratic practices? Can we lay responsibility at the feet of Donald Trump, his willingness to flout the rule of law, his self-dealing, his unending fabrications and lies, his propensity to embrace violence? Well, partially, He's congealed, I think, vulnerabilities within the American democratic system that were there earlier. But again, we need to go back in time to really understand the deeper roots and origins that got us to this point. Trump did not come out of nowhere and neither did the Republican Party's embrace of Donald Trump. What I think is important to note, I'm just gonna make sure I'm watching my time here. So, oops, I forgot to start the timer. <laughs> You're going to give me a sign. Okay, good. I think I'm good still. Yeah. Um, okay, so basically, um, going back in time, the United States, of course, likes to present itself to the world and is, you know, sort of has a self identification as a kind of robust democracy, will bring democracy and freedom to the world, kind of a, you know, sort of a guiding light of those uh, features as kind of the oldest, longest lasting modern uh, democracy. But what's really important is that anti-democratic traditions have been a powerful part of American political ideas uh, since really the nation's establishment. And I think it's those illiberal traditions that we need to tease out to understand the deeper roots of what's happening today. So for example, just to just give you one example, while the Capitol insurrection was unprecedented, the Capitol insurrection was by far not the first time that Americans have sought to overturn elections through violence, right? To go back, uh, Eric Foner has written a terrific seminal book on reconstruction. Let's talked a lot about this. If you look at the reconstruction era, after the end of slavery, with the, when the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment guaranteed African Americans the right to vote, you had the establishment of biracial state governments in many states in the South, right? Well, in some of those places, there were serious, I mean, there was a lot of violence, but there were actual successful coup attempts in several cases. In Colfax, Louisiana, in 1873, a group of whites in the county went down to the courthouse, massacred a whole set of African-American militiamen, and took over, uh, basically overthrew the government. A year later, in 1874, uh, in, uh, also in Louisiana, it, federal troops had to go down to thwart a coup that was in progress to undermine the legally, legitimately elected government. Um, and finally, uh, at the end of the tail end of the century, uh, as Eric Foner pointed out in a, a, in a recent article in Wilmington, North Carolina, you see a biracial elected government was ousted as armed whites took control. So it's just to point out that there is there's a there are earlier traditions and anti democratic sentiments that go back a long time. Um, of course, it's at, in the wake of the end of Reconstruction with the reestablishment of, uh, of, of white supremacy in the South that you have Jim Crow laws that again undermined the right to vote of non-whites in the South for close to 60 years or more, right? So um, those anti-democratic autocratic propensities were very powerful in the South and African Americans were disfranchised wholly and fully, but so were many other non white groups, Native Americans and many other non whites as well. I just pointed this out because the level of restriction, I think we tend to underestimate the extent of some of those features. So in Virginia, for example, in 1912, how many, um, how many Virginians voted in the presidential election of 1912? Well, 150,000 out of a population of 2 million. 150,000 out of a population of 2 million should give you some sense about the restriction of actual, the processes of democracy itself. So the machinery of democracy was somehow formalized, but all sorts of laws from poll taxes to literacy clauses kept African-Americans and many poor whites from 
accessing the polls at all. Now, 4.5 million last November out of 8.5 million Virginians voted. You see that you see how different that is, right? So it's just to, it's to note that depth of kind of uh, propensity toward uh, anti-democratic or sort of, uh, yes, thinking in uh, US history. It's also just to remind some of you who are not real students of American history, the structure of American government as well is fundamentally anti-majoritarian in some of its features, which I think has encouraged the Republican party to adopt the kind of strategies that has, has recently. So ostensibly what the US likes to think of itself as the greatest democracy, it is ironic of course that the popular vote, it's not the popular vote by which we choose the president, right? We choose the president through an intermediary body, which is called the electoral college. Remember the US constitution was established over two centuries ago. And as a result by now, it seems by current 21st century standards of what constitutes a democracy, somewhat reactionary in certain of its features or anti-majoritarian. So that electoral college is specifically means, of course, that you can win a presidential election without winning the popular vote because it's representation by states. It's a federal system. The electoral college is state representation. Those electors decide according to who wins in that state. And then winner take all, most of the time, those electors then vote for that, uh, that candidate. But it means that you can still have a popular vote that is for fall short of your electoral college win. And that's happened several times in US history and it's happened most recently. Uh, it's only one of a Republican, one presidential election where Republicans won since 1988 has it been in fact um, winning by the popular vote. George Bush in 2004 won the popular vote George Bush in 2000 did not, Donald Trump did not in 2016. Had he won the electoral college this time, he would have also definitely not won the popular vote since Biden won out by 7 million. So, he, he, but he did not, it was close, but he did not win. Uh, so, you know, it just gives you some sense about these kind of anti-democratic features. And of course the Senate, there's another uh, anti-democratic feature the control itself over the electoral laws at the federal level. Most electoral laws are established at the state level, but the federal government can make decisions about whether they want to rein in some of these laws. The problem is that, of course, the Republicans don't want to create robust voter laws, and they have the power at the federal level to impede Democrats who want to secure a more robust right to vote. Why do they have that power in the Senate? Not because they represent most um, not the more Americans, but because again, the Senate is representation is done state by state, right? Two senators per state, which means Wyoming and Nevada has a great deal more political power in terms of passing legislation than does New York or California. So it's really just important to remember those features. And I think those features contribute again to uh, the circumstances that we're in today. But at the same time, I think what's really important is that the Republican Party, it's not really until now that you see the full blossoming of these anti-democratic features. And so we need that needs to be explained, right? So despite these kind of anti-majoritarian tendencies, for most of the 20th century, from Dwight D. Eisenhower certainly forward, the Republican Party was a big tent, non-kind of disciplined party that sought to draw in moderates, sought to draw in Democrats it really saw itself as a kind of more centrist party, right? It sort of uh, it embraced the reforms of the New Deal. It called for large infrastructure projects and for money for education, things that are unimaginable in today's Republican party. So how did that, how did we get that shift? How did that happen? It's really, I think, uh, in the moment of the past 40, some odd years uh, and since the 1980s that we see that Republican party has rejected a kind of more bipartisan form of uh, liberalism in favor. It's become a much more Southern and Western oriented party that is 
far more conservative. Um, so, and I think the result has been since the 1980s, once Ronald Reagan came into the White House, there's been an erosion of a lot of the kind of regulatory mechanisms, an erosion of the kind of really welfare state provisions that have left many Americans feeling bereft and feeling aggrieved. Um, and I think that can help us really explain what has happened more recently. If you think about sort of the, 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 the kind of ever growing income inequality that's resulted from those policies, along with declining standards of livings and the kind of, uh, kind of thinning out of the middle class, um, the 2008 economic crisis, along with the ever more browning of America, right? The sort of the, the real fact that the United States is in, for example, California already majority minority and the census has declared if trends continue, it will be majority minority within three decades. So there is this sense, I think, among that kind of white middle class, a feeling of displacement, which, uh, which has been also encouraged by these economic policies. Um, and I think as a result, these kind of currencies of isolationism, nativism have come uh, racism, conspiratorial thinking that were somewhat sidelined at mid-century have come really roaring back. Trump, in other words, became the messiah of Magellan by, by basically picking up on the grievances that had already been really flourishing at the grassroots and that had already congealed a set of thinking and ideas that he then mobilized. Building the wall was touted in the 80s and 90s by Republicans at the grassroots, right? Militarizing the border, ending birthright citizenship. This is not, this is not come from Trump. It came from Republican party ranks and Republican party officials who used it to win elections. In Orange County, a place that I've studied well, first at Suburban Warriors and then gone back again to look at some changes. In 1988, armed guards were stationed outside voting places to intimidate voters uh, and basically to undermine the right to vote. Uh, they wrote down license plates of those who were coming in to vote. They basically declared that they were, they were fearful that Democrats were gonna bus in illegal immigrants. So these strategies and tropes have long been a part of uh, Republican Party uh, sort of strategies. Ballot security, the idea of ballot integrity is not something new in 2021. The Republican Party put out sort of uh, programs and guides of how to work toward ensuring the integrity of the ballot, which really just meant using technical means to get votes thrown out from your opponent and securing them for for, for the Republican Party, uh, again, was something that happened already in the late 80s and 90s. But uh, those, those ideas were, were, were not the dominant, total dominant part of the party, right? There was a whole nother wing of the party that embraced a more majoritarian strategy, a more immigrant friendly strategy. We can reach out to Hispanics. We can, they're, they're, Latinos are naturally, kind of socially conservative, right? Let's draw in the Asian American and uh, Latino vote with kind of, you know, peons to economic independence, to cultural conservatism. Um, George Bush is well known for that, the idea of compassionate conservatism. And by the mid 2000s, it was pretty clear that that, that trajectory was sidelined in favor of a far more kind of nativist exclusionary approach to appeal to overwhelmingly its white social base and to hope to draw in other white voters uh, to make up for the losses of those uh, that would no longer be sought after, the Hispanics and others. So basically, Trump Republicanism, uh, this anti-democratic ethos that he's embraced is much more than about uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and it, I think, threatens to be the Republican blueprint for uh, at least for the near future. Um, it has been very much sort of a very strong swath of Republican party identity. Um, and you know, this pandering to white cultural resentments continues on today, as we saw it most recently with the Virginia election. 
these tendencies toward this kind of exclusionary, illiberal, anti-democratic politics. Are you going to give me a sign? Yes, five minutes. Five minutes, good. Okay, I'm getting there. I'll be there. Um, that they, they, they come to the fore in moments particularly of both super high end income inequality and economic anxiety. So if you go back in US history, look at a moment like the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan gained a tremendous amount of power, right? Five million members controlled the states of, uh, of uh, Indiana and Colorado, among other places with a very strong exclusionary white Christian nationalism, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic sentiment. That was, a, that was a historic moment in the 20th century of that high income inequality. And you see those similar kind of tendencies. It's economic anxieties, I think, that helped to generate, in particular, the strength of this kind of politics. And it's resonance, let's say, among the population. So that all may not sound very hopeful. And so I want to end a little bit with a more helpful note. That is to say, there have been failures of redistribution, I would argue, you know, that has led to these kind of discontents. Um, but there is another side. There are those who are pushing for obviously more progressive uh, politics and the Democratic Party, of course, has been pushing for more robust voting laws. And I think in the alarmism over democracy, we tend to forget. The Brennan Center has published an, a, a sort of a survey of the number of shifts in voting laws. And while Republicans are pushing to tamp down on the vote, 26 states have actually passed measures to expand the vote. So it's not all one thing. The January 6th insurrection took all of the, all of the air out of that day. But that day was historic because it was the day when John Ossoff and uh, Ralph Warnock were elected to the Senate, the first Jewish Senator and the first black Senator from Georgia, a historically racially discriminatory state. Those are real, real boons for a notion of America as a robust uh, democracy and per perhaps also suggest that there may be another path forward. So just to end then, um, I think most of all, there needs to be a reestablishment of a sense of common purpose, a belief uh, that those Americans uh, who are left behind have some way of having a sense of re-including them um, because you know, their turn toward nativism and populism is not the only way to go. There's malleability among discontented American sets of politics. Think back to 2016 when Donald Trump in that primary gained the vote when, when he, in the general election, won the votes of those white working class rural men and women, they had often gone those same voters for Bernie Sanders, right? So there isn't, these politics are malleable. Class grievances can move in one direction, they can move in another. Um, that's not to say it will happen, but it is certainly a hope that with a set of robust progressive politics and mobilization, that a more that a revitalized, more progressive democracy can be established. I know that sounds, it's an alarming moment, but I just want to leave us with some sense also of it's not over <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Thank you very much. So there's a glimmer of hope. Thank you very much for your speech. Before, before I'm going to hand over to Raimund, and before later on we're going to discuss the deficiencies of democracy and the structural problems of this change uh, within the Republican Party, I have a few very obvious questions that probably many of us have um, be before we go on. First, of, first question, you said um, this party has become much more conservative, but Trump isn't conservative. Trump is about Trump. It, Trump is about power. Trump is about um, narcissism. Trump is about, you know, being right. So um, where is the extremely conservative agenda in that, in that in those politics? Well, I think actually what Trump has done politically in office is largely meet the demands of the elite segment of the Republican Party that favors deregulation, favors getting rid of economic controls over the market, favors getting the U.S. out of the climate control agreement. All of that is classic conservative Republican fare. So in that, what he's done for the most part, total Republican fare. 
What he hasn't done, this verbal rhetoric, he never built that wall because Republican parties, were they gonna vote for that? They're never gonna vote for that. But he appeals to those voters' sentiments with that kind of populist language of nativism. But he doesn't, he's not able, he hasn't achieved it and nor does he really, I think even try because he knows he can't and he's not that himself. You're right. He's about Trump, yeah, but he because knows because populism that. isn't like isn't occurs conservatism all the time. You know, there's... not always, but in the agendas of what's actually passed, it has been right. So I think that's really important to separate out. It's a language of populism, but in what actually has come out of it, in terms of actual policy, has largely favored everything that Mitch McConnell and all of those Republicans want, which is why they're so behind Trump, because they made a Faustian bargain. We're going to get what we want. We're going to get conservative court picks we wanted for years. We're going to get the policies that we wanted of deregulation. And we're going to have to deal with this kind of stuff, which is this is what our loyal base wants. Two more quick questions. Second question you said there is, I don't even dare to say that. I thought it was not not allowed, but the, you talked about the browning of America. Uh, but again, some doubt, because part of the uh, people who voted for him were, for example, those Latin Americans who have been driven out of the country or not even let in. So how does that work? Well, there, it's, there, the Republican Party had a much more robust tie on the Hispanic vote earlier, and they are, Trump does speak to some of them, but by far not the vast majority of them. I mean, the Democratic Party has a hold on over 70% of, Republic, of, of Hispanic votes. But there, they, there is some appeal, especially for those who feel, I made it here, I want those who come in behind me to come in legally, right? So Trump can play to that card. I think that is undoubtedly uh, true. Um, so, but say, say what the rest of your question was, because as uh, part of that, so. That's, that's fine. I wanted okay. to ask a third one. The third question is, you said there's a Faustian pact. And as we know, most of those hundred and whatever, 80 senators voted, 140, 100 something, 147 voted against Biden's uh, election into office. But at the same time, for example, now in Virginia, the guy who was voted governor tried to distance himself from Trump. Uh, the Bushes, for example, tried to distance themselves from Trump. So um, there seems to be two different camps. Uh, why would you win, a, win an election in Virginia by saying I'm not a Trumpist? So I think it's correct that probably the Republican Party somewhat wants to separate itself from the most lawless aspects of Trumpism. After all, it was pretty horrid scenes what happened on January 6th. I mean, you know, I mean, they themselves were under attack. So I don't think that didn't have an impact on the party, but they did not at all do what I thought they would do, which was to come out clearly and totally distance themselves from Donald Trump. They did on that day. Mitch McConnell came out and condemned Donald Trump and a few others did as well for being responsible for the events of that day. But since then, everything that, the, that, that folks have tried to do to investigate what happened and who was responsible, the Republican Party is not willing to go there. They also have basically allowed Trump to remain the, the kind of head of the Republican Party informally. They've not distanced themselves at all. I think you're right in Virginia because it's a more moderate state. He's been more careful, but has also pandered to these cultural resentments in the same way. So I think the heirs to Trump may distance themselves from those most horrible lawless features, but will still uh, pander to those same kind of cultural resentments. That's what my sense is. Very confusing. We'll talk about that later. Raymond, are you going to explain to us what happened in that strange country? In, well, I'm uh, trying to uh, present you with some observations, journalistic observations. Uh, my time as a historian is long, long ago. Uh, but I think it's it was a brilliant idea to ha have a discussion about America exactly in this week. Uh, it was already mentioned the defeat of the Democrats in Virginia, which is a big defeat. Virginia has been uh, the, uh, the, the state south of uh, Washington D.C. has been um, a democratic uh, had a democratic governor for for many years. Few, few, uh, just I think only one Repub Republican governor made it. And this is a very difficult uh, and crucial time for the Biden ad administration. In one year, uh, we're going to have the midterm elections for Congress. Uh, 
and the, the Biden administration didn't get any of the big projects they had through. And I don't know if, it's, if it now it's not going to get even more difficult because of the political situation is changing. And I would, I, I, my starting point would be the, what, what's going on in America is important for Americans, of course, 330 million, but it's nearly as important for us too. It's important for the rest of the world. It's important for, for, for political developments in Europe and in other uh, parts of the world because the United States are international trendsetters as far as political developments is concerned. This may be surprising because uh, we all discuss about the American empire decreasing and the clout of the United States and world politics decreasing. That, that might be true. But one of the central elements of the American rule, if you want, in the last half century was soft power. And part of soft power was the fact that all the trends that happened in America in some way or the other way got translated in other parts uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, therefore, if we watch the outcome of Trumpism in America, we also have in mind that could be the outcome of Orban in Hungary or the uh, outcome uh, of the Polish nationalist leadership and so on and so forth. And therefore I think it's, uh, it is really important that we dis discuss America with having in our brain the idea we are discussing a little bit about ourselves uh, too. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Trumpism, has come uh, in a moment where uh, nationalist populism in Europe had already taken place and taken foot. Uh, there was, Orban was there before Trump became president. We had all kinds of threats of uh, uh, xenophobic uh, authoritarian nationalist demagogues in Europe, in other parts of the world. But Trump was the crown of all that. Because here you had the president of the United States, the president of the country that brought democracy to Germany, to Austria, to many other places, who is attacking dem democracy, trying to destroy uh, democracy. So this was, I think, a, a very pivotal moment for, for, for world uh, politics. And uh, you had many of the elements that you mentioned for Trump, you can find them in uh, the uh, uh, nationalist demagogue movements uh, in Europe too. Uh, the I think one of the difference that make Trumpism even more threatening is that you don't have this mass base. I mean, Trump has, uh, a mass base of followers in his meetings in the election campaign. There were hundreds of thousands of people who were ready to uh, wait for hours for hours for this guy to show up, who uh, traveled for long uh, distances to see him, to hear him, who adore him uh, as a leader, much more than, I don't know,
uh, pessimistically. I would uh, expand that a little bit. Yeah, for me, studying uh, American uh, history, it was always striking the capacity uh, of America uh, to uh, self-correct itself and the. Uh, the, the capacity of the American system to overcome uh, dark times, to overcome times where, where the crimes of, of, of the government were, were getting worse and worse. So it, it, this seems to me the capacity of self-correction in the American democracy is something special. And, that if you look at other big democracies, I don't think that you can find it so easily. I mean, you can, maybe that's a journalistic idea more than a historical analysis, but I mean, the biggest example of this capacity of self-correction, of course, is the civil rights movement, where you had for decades, you had racism through law in, in, in big parts of the country. And the civil rights movement uh, uh, could uh, overturn this uh, tradition, could overturn the, uh, the, the political uh, tra tradition, would introduce in the country something that uh, became a, a, a signal for the other part of America, namely direct action demonstrations, a, 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 the movement of not only democracy through the ballot box, but also the democracy through civil uh, society. And that uh, second example, the Vietnam War, the, the, a war that was built with lies, that uh, was terrible for uh, Indochina, terrible for, for America, but at the same time, building on the tradition of the civil rights movement, you had the biggest anti-war movement in, in the history of a country in waging a war. It never had, had happened before. You have the government that wages a war, countries in a war, and you have at the same time a mass movement representing a big part of the youth in that same country. And Okay, America lost the war, but the anti-war movement won the ideas, yeah, uh, if you want to say. So also here, I think that, that and, and that is a tradition that, that you felt uh, when, when you saw the, the Black Lives Matter demonstration uh, last year and, and uh, the whole opening up of the 60s, of course, was linked to that tradition. So uh, uh, let me jump to Florianihof here because I mentioned to uh, Professor Ter that I know that place pretty well uh, because uh, in my earlier youth, which is uh, some time ago, I was quite often here distributing leaflets because it was very busy and uh, many young people were here and these leaflets were uh, trying to mobilize for Vietnam solidarity demonstrations, of course, 71. 72, and this was a popular place. So you had a good chance if you distributed a lot of leaflets, uh, be, a lot of people here would, would then come to this demonstration. There were quite often these demonstrations. They went through in, the inner city, Marie Hilferstrasse, often were stopped in front of the America, American embassy, uh, were prepared by teach-ins. Then there were sit-ins in front of the police line. Uh, some people were burning American flags. And then they, on the next day, uh, the newspapers would write, well, there's another anti-American demonstration. And maybe some of the people who participated here also thought, yeah, this is an anti-American demonstration. But uh, think about it, teach-ins, sit-ins, this was all ideas that came from America. The most popular speaker at these demonstrations were the representative of the American anti-war movement. Even the burning of the American flag was an idea that people got from the students of Kent and Berkeley. So in reality, in reality, this was the demonstrations that picked up on the capac American capacity to self-correct and picked up the American tra tradition of, uh, uh, of, of movement, of, civi of civil, civil, civil activity and were in retrospect, not at all anti-American, but contributed to, the, uh, uh, to expand democracy, not to reduce the uh, democracy. So, uh, I mean, uh, what about today? Um, I, I remember the American historian Arthur Schlesinger had this idea, there are liberal uh, times in American politics, and then there Cycles. are conservative yeah. times. And this is a kind of uh, uh, 
zigzag, if you, if you want to say. I don't know if that's still something that is discussed. You, you, may, you may perhaps uh, explain a little bit, but it is true. I mean, as far as the, the president is concerned, it's striking. I mean, you had Bush 41 and, uh, and then came Clinton, then it Bush 43 and then came came Obama, and you should not underestimate the cultural, uh, tremendous cu cultural uh, uh, importance of, 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 of Barack Obama being president. It's like if you have a Muslim uh, being uh, uh, chancellor of Austria or Germany, yeah? it's, it's absolutely the, the same. Uh, so culturally, yes, there's sort of both elements are here. Politically, uh, we, we have to see, man, there's this tendency that you, uh, you describe, uh, describe, but at the same time, we have to say, I mean, even in the conservative presidencies, uh, the social security system in the, in the US, which was built by Roosevelt and expanded by uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, was not dismantled. It was rather expanded. Uh, the last expansion was uh, by, by Obama. Uh, so, if, I mean, what now Biden tries to do is get the, more closer to the social welfare st uh, state we have here. We don't know if he will succeed, but it's not dismantled, yeah, despite the big economic uh, differences and, 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 and the, and the, and the uh, economic uh, contradictions. And you have these both elements in, in American reality, the, the element of mobilization, the Black Lives Matter movement, which helped, of course, mobilize for, for Biden, and, the, uh, and at the same time, the grip of the Trumpistas, maybe fascism of uh, our time on the Republican Party, complicating a little bit things is, I would say, the international situation because the role of America in the world is not the same as it used to be. The self-confidence of the American ruling class is we rule the world and the reality is different. Uh, and that is also always a dangerous moment for, for a country, how to cope with such, such a situation that you think you, re, uh, you should rule the world, but the world doesn't think so. Uh, so what do you do about it? So uh, it's, we should, I think, continue to follow very closely uh, what Ameri uh, the American developments because it will help us deal with our contradictions here too. Thank you. Thank you very much. A glimmer of hope combined with some sentimental sentimentality <laughs> about America that's maybe past, maybe not. Some quick questions <laughs> as well. Um, I personally do have a strong inner resistance against the idea that Orban or Mazowiecki um, are, ha have been like are comparable to what happens in the States at the moment, especially because the systems are so completely different. We have um, uh, um, strong, very, you know, state democracies, uh, a control of the media, which is not the case in America. Um, we have uh, very new party systems partially, which is not the case in America. Anyways, I have a problem with that comparison, but what I think is exciting, and let me just ask about that. Maybe the framing is, is uh, an international movement of the social media, which, which uh, makes all countries alike and all pop polit political movements alike. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that it goes over social media. I mean, you, you know, the, the Turkish president is, I mean, it's, of course, it's the Turkish environment and so on, but it, he's inspired by Trump. All these, these authoritarian demagogues, they were very happy with Trump to try to be Trump alikes because America is the uh, soft power of the world. Of course, it's an observation that uh, should not. Uh, I mean, you, you, you it doesn't uh, spare you to analyze the situation each each country. But I would think that that uh, there is a there are international tendencies in in politics. I, I would think so. Yeah? Uh, you, you can't reduce politics in any country to international tendencies, but they are there. Yeah? And Trump was cert certainly a force that reinforced all these tendencies. Look, Look, even our chancellor, former chancellor Kurz, yeah, well, he, I mean, he obviously liked uh, 
uh, Trump. He was not against it that, that Trump liked him. And you have you can discuss all kinds of elements of, of the worship, it is try, try the, the element to mobilize the own base as a worshiping base, a sect-like uh, event, uh, and, and other and, and other elements too. So uh, I think it was right that. Uh, we who were not happy with these kind of tendencies were all happy when Trump was defeated. So one, more, one more question. You were talking about the capability of self-correction. What would need to happen at the moment in order to save American democracy if that's necessary or possible? I don't know whether you agree. A split in the Republican Party. I think that's pretty easy. Huh? If you have a clear cut split in the Republican Party, you have the, uh, even the people that you mentioned that still exist, the Democratic Conservatives, and they build their own party or clearly create their own political identity. And you, on the other side, you have the Trump people, then I think the, the crisis if over, is over. As long as this is not the case, as long as the Trumpists control the leadership, of the party, this is a, a very dangerous situation. This is the big conservative party of American democracy. It's like, I don't know, Le Pen taking over Les Républicains en, Fran en France or AFD taking over the CDU. Yeah? That was what happened. So if that can be reversed or changed, I think then the mechanism of self-correction would have worked. Is a, a split of the Republican party problem at all? If at the moment, Trumpism works, and that's where the money is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think talked about I, money yet. I, that's the the problem is basically that I don't see it coming internally within the Republican Party to rework themselves, unless, and this is not my idea, but I can't remember where I read it. But unless uh, somebody had said, I read recently, you know, what would it take, right, for the Republican Party to shift gears? And the answer, and I think that's right, is a massive defeat. Like if they were massively defeated, then they're going to have to really rethink it, right? I mean, they, they, right now they're still succeeding with some of this agenda to hold their base and to get win elections. So I would say it's actually it's it's the it's sort of kind of come from outside. Somehow the Democrats have to revitalize themselves enough and win enough that the Republican Party party is sufficiently defeated that uh, that they they then basically decide to internally revamp. Barring that, they're going to continue down. I think they were going to continue down this path. I don't see internally that they're not because it's so far been quite successful for them. Barring, of course, what happened in 2020, which I think was about the the level of craziness of Trump rather than, uh, you know, sort of the uh, the level of craziness, which drove turnout on the, on the side of the Democrats as well as on the side of, yeah, but, uh, but Trump will be back in, in, in three. It's very probably he'll he'll be he'll be he'll run again, he'll be back. So with all his craziness, yeah. Right. No, well, no glimmer of hope here. Okay. Let me let, let me ask the two of you um a probably rather complicated question. Self-correction, uh, when it when the only the only hope that you're that you're putting that they're able to think of is like a defeat of the Republicans or a new movement within the Democrats, that is an inner party self-correction. Is this democracy, which is structurally probably overaged, uh, not very functional anymore. Right. It has been, uh, the concept has been made 300 years ago. Um, it is, it was meant for the, the land of the brave and the free without, a, without mail, without telephone, without, um, I don't know, for a federal, federal state uh, of huge dimensions. None of that is true anymore because, you know, we live in a completely modern different society. So is there any probability or possibility of a democracy that is not made for these for them for the for the for the modern times to redefine itself I, I i don't know what the possibilities are i mean people have talked about trying to reform the system itself to make it actually more democratic right for example to get rid of the electoral college there's a book by alex Kieser. why do we still have the electoral college which is really if you're interested in that question it's fabulous to read that history but you know, it's also not just the electoral college, but you know, sort of the, 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 there's other moves afoot to let's say bring in Puerto Rico as a state, right? 
Uh, basically, you know, if you bring in additional representatives that are going to be Democratic, that's a new, that's another kind of reform. Make Washington, D.C. a state. It's a tax place without representation. So, you know, th these are sort of there are ideas out there. Get rid of the filibuster, which would allow Joe Biden to get some of his plans through, which I think would infrastructure plans would I think satisfy a lot of those folks who are Trumpites, but not nothing's happening and his approval rating has been plummeting as a result because of this kind of gridlock in DC. So I, I don't know what the uh, what the possibility, those are all ideas, but how, how real they are in being able to pass them, I think is very, very questionable. Well, uh, I think uh, as far as small steps, yes, yeah, that, that is certainly possible in this, conjuncture, but we are in a phase of retreat. We are not in a phase of offensive. We are in a phase of defense. We have to play defense. Yeah? And in a defense, uh, you don't usually change the whole army. Yeah? You try to hold your ground. And then uh, if you can go in the offensive, then it's another, it's another time. So uh, I would, I mean, that's also, I have a bit of, of doubts about the uh, question of revitalization of, of the uh, Democratic Party through a stronger left. Uh, the left, it is, I mean, the left, uh, left political ideas are out. Yeah? And that has to do with many, uh, many reasons, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, Stalinism and, and the, the fact that the tradition of uh, the leftist socialist tradition had failed in, in, uh, in many parts of the world uh, un, uh, under Stalinism. And that uh, today we have a, in the Czech parliament is not one member of parliament from the Social Democratic Party or the Communist Party, not one. Yeah? Uh, in Poland, it's very, very few uh, parties. I mean, okay, we, we, in Germany, we, we had the big win of the SPD, big win. Well, how many, 25%, well, 26%. <laughs> it just said it's a boring social okay, democrat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's, I don't think this is a, a, a time where you say, okay, we, we, if you have a pure uh, uh, party that serves the people, then the people will understand that and vote yeah. for, for their party. I doubt that, yeah. I think basically the idea to have, to understand that democracy is on the defensive and then you have to try to get everybody together who is ready to defend democracy. And that's basically what Biden did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what the opposition in Hungary tries to do now and in other countries too. That is uh, more appropriate than the idea if you have the wonderful leftist party who, who defends the interests of the working class, the working class will follow. Okay. I have, I wrote down about 100 questions concerning your book, but I'm not going to ask any of them. I'm just going to ask one more question, then I'm going to open the floor to everybody and on Zoom too. We were talking about very many good reasons why this is a good time to talk about America. Virginia is one reason, the problems of Biden another reason, Biden in Europe at the moment in Glasgow, although I think it's back already, okay. And then there's another reason, which is the Supreme Court discussing abortion, uh, Roe versus Wade, um, and Amy Comey Barrett sitting on that, uh, on that Supreme Court, make, asking questions that might, that again are a glimmer of hope. So in your book, in the introduction, um, um, Suburban Warriors wrote, you wrote about the US as being the first Christian uh, republic. Is this this debate about abortion, that whole, this whole movement, the, the, um, which is getting stronger and much more aggressive by the day, is that the return of Christianity or is that again, another expression of populism? Hmm. I mean, it's a great question, but I, I think they're linked because, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of both, right? I mean, I think that there's a whole set of different folks in that coalition that are uh, anti-abortion, some of whom hated everything that Trump did and got it over themselves to vote for Trump because of the abortion issue. Catholics, conservative Catholics, as well as evangelicals. So, you know, that's not populism, that's pure Christianity. That's, that's really solid Christianity. I think the US overwhelmingly, as we well know, is a more religious nation historically. 
uh, until this day. And I think that has affected politics. And I think that is definitely a part of uh, a part of the mobilization. So I think, but it, again, sort of a segment of that is, is those evangelicals are also linked to Trump populism, right, within the Republican Party. So I think you can say it's both. And Raimund, last question to you. Abortion, cancel culture, the migration debate, Me Too, Black Lives Matter. Are those all democratic topics that the Republicans find disgusting or are there bridges that could be crossed? Well, I think that, that uh, you have in all times you have exaggerations. So it, it may be that you have, on, uh, I mean, you, you would know that better than I do cancel culture on, in, in American universities. Uh, I, mean, I, I have to say, I have, a, I have a soft spot for people who are so engaged and uh, so mobilized that they uh, try to prevent people to speak as long uh, as it's not, uh, and uh, it doesn't lead to censorship. Yeah? It just means, okay, here in our neighborhood, young, young people of 18, 90 or, or 20, in our neighborhood, we want to rule, okay. As long as, as it's not translated into censorship, into a system, uh, I don't know if there's not uh, more propaganda uh, uh, against this uh, so-called danger of cancel culture than, than the real uh, danger. And you have to find a big tent yeah, where all these elements in a way uh, can uh, be under that uh, big tent and under understand the big goal. Yeah? And I mean, the, the fact they mentioned what you, the question of religion. Yeah? I also here, I would say, again, my theory that Trumpism is an international phenomenon, you have in all places where you have uh, authoritarian demagogues, this is with religion, yeah? I mean, in, in, in India, Modi, who is a Hindu semi-fascist, yeah? Semi, not, not it's, it's clear, it's, it's Hindu. Uh, Hindu religion plays a big role, yeah? Mm -hmm. I don't need to, to talk about Poland or, 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 or other places. So the fact that these leaders uh, or these cur currents are, also have cultural and religious elements is not unique to, to the US.